Well, hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to our Bible study again, our adult study. Uh, it's good to be with you, and uh, we are working through the Lord's Prayer together. So I'm so excited to spend some time with you in what I'm calling the world's greatest prayer. Uh, that's the title of the, of the study, and it's not hard to understand why uh, we would call this prayer the world's greatest prayer. There have been a lot of great prayers out there in the world uh, through history and a lot of great prayers out there in the world, but this prayer is special, the Lord's Prayer, because it's the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. So it has been a delight to learn from the model prayer, and I'm glad that you're able to be with us as we're working through this. So right now on your screen, you should see a link uh, that will show you where you can download the studies that we're using in our class, uh, uh, our time in the Lord's Prayer. And um, all six of the studies are there on this site, so you can you know, choose to just download them and watch them on, the, on your screen as we're going through the study, or you can print them out, and you can have all six printed at once and just have them ready to go every time we meet, whatever works for you. But I do know this, it will be really helpful if you have the material in front of you as we're working through our stuff, because I'll be working and leading you through that, looking at the questions and reading the scriptures that are printed on that page. Every once in a while, I have a quote or something also that I print on that page. So it would be super helpful if you have that in front of you, either printed or on your screen, however that works for you. And uh, today we're in session three. So if you're looking at which of those six sessions you need to download or print for today, it would be the third session. And we're on that petition, give us this day our daily bread. So look forward to um, being in the word with you today. So as always, uh, we wanna be prayed up and ready for what God has for us. So if you would, would you bow your heads as we begin with prayer? Well, dear Lord, Heavenly Father God, thank you for loving us so very much that uh, you gave us a special way to stay connected with you. We call it prayer. It's something that is so easy to take for granted, and it's something so easy to forget what an amazing gift it is, that at any moment, at any time, we can just close our eyes, bow our heads, and speak to you, and you, God, the author and creator of the universe, stop whatever you're doing and give us your full attention. It's incredible if you think about it, Lord. And we are just so blessed that you love us that much, that deeply, that whatever is in our hearts and minds, you are there to listen and to hear and to answer. So we thank you for the gift of prayer. Especially today, we thank you for the gift of the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, as it teaches us how to pray and what we should pray for and and how you answer our prayers today, especially as we look at this great petition, give us this day our daily bread, we will learn so much about how you provide for us and how you care for us and how every need that we have, you have promised to fulfill. And so we just pray that we would have a better understanding of our needs and that we would be able to bring those to you and, and look to you for answers in life and not to ourselves. And so use this great petition and this great prayer, the world's greatest prayer, to teach us to rely and trust on you for all of our needs. So to that end, I pray you'd bless me as I teach today and for the many folks who lead or who, who study, those who are at home watching online, we just pray that uh, you would give them a good hour of uninterrupted time so that they can focus in and get into the word and scriptures and, and grow in their faith and knowledge of you, Lord. So use this great gift of technology uh, to connect us to each other and connect us to you. Thank you, God, for this day and this opportunity we have to, to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it. Amen. All right, my friends, if you have your studies, you'll want to get that out. And uh, we're going to start with this third session, Give Us This Day Our Daily Bread. These are the exact words that Jesus gave to us from Matthew chapter 6. So I want to just start off with this. Um, have you ever, you know, just to get our minds wrapped around the concept of where we're going, have you ever known someone or heard of someone who has just really endured some incredibly hard physical or emotional or economic setbacks in their lives and still found incredible joy and peace in the midst of it? And I can tell you stories in my ministry here at Faith of the amazing people that I've met who in some of the most difficult and hardest circumstances never lost their confidence and faith in God. 
I'll just tell you one of my favorites. It was um, a man that I love and have known to, to uh, be able to call a dear friend was, was in dire circumstances in the hospital. Uh, he had had some issues that were going on for a while and it came to a critical point where the doctors said to him that the next 24 hours would determine whether or not he would live or die. These next 24 hours and how he recovered and how he came out of where he was would determine how much longer he had on this earth. And he was so weak that he could barely speak with just the smallest whisper. And I remember uh, visiting him in the hospital and um, praying with him and he wanted to say something to me and he kind of beckoned me down and after we had talked about his circumstances and his wife was in the room and she had filled me in on where he was and what was going on he asked me to to put my ear down by his mouth so i could hear what he said and i did that and you know I'll, he said something i will never ever forget something i never ever expected to hear he said pastor dan this is a good place to be and i was like what <laughs> you're you're in the hospital you're 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 struggling for life you may not even be alive 24 hours from now and you're telling me this is a good place to be what i found out later after he pulled through you know after god worked that um, worked a miracle in his life is that he just really found that at that moment everything that mattered became clear to him everything that was important sorted and sifted itself out and he realized at that moment that he had faith and that he had jesus and that whether he lived or whether he died it was going to be okay because he was in the lord's arms this is a good place to be you know i think that uh, Mother Teresa had that right. There's a quote uh, on your sheet that I just have always appreciated and loved. Mother Teresa said, you will never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you need. Just think about that quote. You'll never know that Jesus is all that you need until you find yourself in a place where Jesus is all you need. And when you find yourself in that place, like my friend did in the hospital, where there was nothing left to grab hold of, nothing else to hold on to, it wasn't about what he had collected in life, it wasn't about his friends, it wasn't about his health, all he had at that moment was Jesus. And he found at that moment that that's all he needed. That's what this petition in the Lord's Prayer is all about. This petition, give us this day our daily bread, is asking for God to give us the things that we need in life and to find complete fulfillment, complete satisfaction, complete contentment in the things and the needs that God has given us. Man, I know how hard that is. I know how hard it is to be content with what God has given when sometimes our, our sinful self screams for so much more. When, when life busts in and things hurt and emotions are, 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 are strained and people are mean and we wonder about the future, in that moment, it's so hard to be thankful for what God has given and not want more. But we'll find in the study today that that's all we have. And hopefully we'll learn that if that's all we have, that that is more than enough. So let's get at it, okay? Let's see if we can move down this road uh, to this understanding that I believe will just change the way we think about ourselves and about life. So check out the box on the sheet. And I'm just going to be honest with you about this petition in the Lord's Prayer. As I've prayed this prayer in my life in the past, uh, for years, I blew right past the give us this day our daily bread. It's just not something when I was praying this prayer, I'd spend a lot of time in my mind thinking about. I would usually just run right past that. And I think there's reasons for that. Number one, I've always been blessed with my own daily bread. 
What I mean by that is I've grown up at a remarkable place in history. I really have. I've grown up in a time where I never had to live through a, a Great Depression. I've never had to live through any sort of serious time of war. I've never had to live with rationing. I've never had to live in a time where I didn't have anything that I would ever want or need. I was blessed to be in a family that, that gave me everything and, and helped me through everything and had resources to provide for my every need. So, you know, what I'm saying is after years and years of this provision, it's very easy to come to expect that abundance, can't, isn't it? And, and to forget about what a gift it is to have these things. It's very easy to start to see the things of life that we have today as some sort of entitlement, as some sort of something that I just deserve to have. You get used to having it, and after a while you begin to think that you should have it. You get used to having it, and after a while you start to th uh, think if you don't have it, that you're being cheated, or life is unfair, or God doesn't love you, or this world stinks, you see? That's what can happen after years and years and years of living with abundance. And so in the Lord's Prayer, when I would get to this section, give us this day our daily bread, sometimes I would just not ask for what I fully expect to get. Do you see what I'm saying? Sometimes we don't ask for what we fully anticipate is a right for us to have. And that's wrong. And I, and I had to just really catch myself in, in my understanding. This prayer reminds me every time I pray now, give us this day our daily bread, to not take for granted the abundance that I'm blessed with here in the United States of America, the abundance I'm blessed with in my family and world in which I live. So, you see, that's why one reason I would just blow right past this prayer, give us this petition, give us this day our daily bread. I wonder if you've ever done the same, right? The second reason I a lot of times would just blow right past this petition is because I couldn't wait to get to the next petition. <laughs> Forgive us our trespasses. See, there's where I usually want to go. That's where I want to spend my time. That's, that's where I want to come to God with this need I have for forgiveness. And so sometimes I'm already anticipating the next petition as I'm praying this petition about forgiveness. Um, but now as I've studied the petition of the Lord's Prayer, uh, I've got a new understanding of how important this petition, give us this daily bread is. And these few simple words change the way I look and think about God, about my life and about my purpose in the world. So I'm hoping that as we look at this petition, give us this day our daily bread, that these three things will happen for us, that it will decrease our anxiety about the future. Wouldn't that be great if that could happen, all right, really, uh, that our worries and fears about the future, that could they be just settled down a little bit? It can happen through this petition. Second, that it would increase a growing awareness of his presence and God's activity in our lives, that we would see his hand providing for our daily needs. And third, that we would develop a deeper sense of contentment in who we are and how we live. Uh, just a, what a wonderful thing if we could have these three things in our lives. Wouldn't you agree? So let's look at the petition. Imagine that you are Jesus' disciples. And after that question, that great question, Lord, would you teach us how to pray? He gives the Lord's Prayer. And when he got Jesus to this section, give us this day our daily bread, the disciples would have totally understood this in a way different way than you and I do today. Our ears today in 2020 hear the word bread in a totally different way than the disciples 2,000 years ago would have heard the word bread, right? Here's what I mean by that. Uh, when Jesus said bread, they would have known exactly what he was talking about. Their thoughts would have immediately connected them back to their Old Testament history back to the deliverance of the people out of bondage in Egypt, to the daily bread, the manna, 
that God provided for his people every day for 40 years in their wandering in the wilderness. See, for the folks in Jesus' day, the, the disciples remembered God's providing for his people through manna and through quail and through water those 40 years, right? And, and the symbol for that, that providence, the symbol for God's providing for them was bread. And so when Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread, they would have immediately connected those words to how God provided for their ancestors in the wilderness because they were eagerly waiting for God to do that again, for God to provide for their daily needs again like he did before. So we've got to really get to the heart of this. So uh, on your sheet, question one, the first check. Is this usually what you think about when you pray the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread? You think back to the manna in the wilderness? Probably not, right? But to properly understand what Jesus is talking about, we need to understand the history of the daily bread thing. Because Jesus connects daily bread back to the Old Testament bread and projects it into the future. So we need to understand what it was for Jesus back then too. So I'm going to ask for you to get your Bibles out and turn to Exodus chapter 7. Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. So again, we're looking at how does the manna in the wilderness, right? Why is that such an important thing for the people of God from the time it happened all the way to the time of Christ? And it starts in Exodus 7, when God made a promise to Moses and to the people of Israel. Verses 1 through uh, 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh and to your brother Aaron. He will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt with mighty acts of judgment. I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. So here's this great promise, what God is going to do for his people. He's going to deliver them from the most powerful, most prosperous nation in the world at that time, from Egypt. So looking at these chapters, it's easy to see how God used Charlton Heston. Oops, <laughs> I mean Moses and Aaron, right? Don't you love the movie, The Ten Commandments? Uh, one of my all-time favorite movies ever, right? How he used uh, Moses and Aaron to mightily provide and deliver his people from bondage. So here's my question. After witnessing this mighty deliverance, again, after God's people saw what he did, how God went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Pharaoh and God defeated him hands down, when God sent the plagues, when God sent the angel of death, when God sent the pillar of fire at night, the pillar of cloud in the day, when God parted the Red Sea so the people could cross, when God brought the Red Sea back down and, and uh, drowned all of Pharaoh's army so they could no longer pursue them, after seeing all of that, what would you think the people would think about God's care for them? I mean, if it were you, and you had seen those things with your own eyes, would you ever doubt that God loved you? Would you ever doubt that God is powerful enough to give you whatever you need? Could you ever imagine believing that, that God wasn't able to provide for you and to care for you and to rescue you? I mean, it seems crazy to think that that could ever happen, right? Well, let's read on about our wonderful people of Israel from Exodus chapter 15 this time. Flip a couple chapters. Exodus 15, I want to read verses 23 and 24. And then I'm going to skip to chapter 16, uh, verses 1 through 3. So after seeing all of the deliverance, after crossing the Red Sea, they get into the desert, and here's where they find themselves. Exodus chapter 15, verses 23 and 24. 
When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. Now, I, I want you to hear this little star of this, right? It wasn't that there wasn't water. There was water there, but they didn't think it tasted good. <laughs> so you just you keep that in the back of your mind. It wasn't that there wasn't water. There was water there for them, but it didn't taste good. So verse 24, the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? Now moving to chapter 16, the whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Is that a wow? That's a wow moment for me. After all they had seen, after all they had seen after and experienced, after the greatest miracles of the plagues and the Red Sea, after God leading them with the pillar of fire at day and night, what did they think about God? That he wasn't going to provide for them anymore, that he wouldn't care for them anymore. And they actually grumbled against God. They complained against God and say to themselves, oh, do you remember how good it was in the old days when we were slaves in Egypt? There we sat around pots of meat, they said, <laughs> as if they had everything they ever wanted. They completely forgot or lied to themselves or tricked themselves into believing that it was better being a slave than it was being with God in the desert. I think that is just an amazing thing, isn't it? The people were grumbling and complaining against God, even though he had already mightily blessed them. Aren't you glad that we're not like that? Hello. <laughs> I think we are just like that. We are just like that. Isn't it amazing how easy it is for God's people today, you and me, to forget about his blessings in the past, to forget about the many ways he has stepped into our lives and worked miracles and provided for us and cared for us in the past, isn't it amazing how easy it is to forget those blessings when the fears and worries about today get in our hearts and our lives? It just amazes me how quick I am to be fearful and worrisome and doubt God about today and tomorrow when I've seen him bless me so many times in the past. We are just like those people, grumblers, complainers, thinking that God's not really doing his job the way he could or should, or just asking always, why? Why, God, you know, the questions, if you're a good God, why are you letting these bad things happen to me? God, if you really care about me, then why does it hurt so bad? God, if you really are so good and powerful, then why am I suffering when everyone else seems to be doing so good? Right? Those are the kind of things, the grumbling and complaining the exact same things that the children of Israel were doing in the wilderness. See, there's some lessons that we can learn from them in the wilderness, and we're also going to learn some amazing things about how our amazing God. So number three on your information sheet, right? What was God's answer to these grumbling, complaining, ingrate, ungrateful people? What was his response, his reply to them? Let's take a look at Exodus chapter 16. I'm going to read the whole, a big chunk here, verses 4 through 36 of Exodus chapter 16. This is how God immediately responds to the grumbling and complaining about all oh, the good old days. God, why did you bring us out here to suffer and die? What did God say? Then the Lord said, I will rain down bread from heaven 
for you. And the people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in. And this is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared. And when the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? <laughs> For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Each one is to gather as much as he needs. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it out by the omer, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. Then Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. Shock. <laughs> they kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as he needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person, and the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. See whatever is left and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is what the sixth day he has given you for bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where he is on the seventh day. No one is to go out. And so the people rested on the seventh day. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come so they can see the bread I gave to you to eat in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it then place it before the Lord to be kept for generations to come. As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna in front of the testimony that it might be kept. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years <laughs> until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. An omer is one-tenth of an ephah. All right, that's a long section, but I think it's important for us to see 
what God did in response to the grumbling and complaining of the people that he had just rescued. How God would teach them to rely and trust on him and not rely and trust on them, on them their, themselves, and how God would teach them what they really need compared to their greeds, what they think they need. So this lesson uh, took a long time to learn, didn't it? How many years did this lesson have to happen before they would learn that God would provide? 40 years. For 40 years, they had to relearn, learn to trust in God to provide for their needs. For 40 years, they had to wake up every single morning and look outside of their tent and see the bread. For 40 years, they learned that day after day after day after day, God would provide for their needs. For 40 years, they learned that on the sixth day, they could take double and it wouldn't spoil. For 40 years, they had to learn that on the seventh day, there wouldn't be anything because they had been able to collect double the day before. For 40 years, they could see that God had a plan, that God was working, that God was delivering, that God was giving them everything they needed. For 40 years, they learned to trust God to provide for their needs. Now, isn't it interesting, you know, as I read this verse, how many times the word grumbling comes up? It's as if God says, listen, you guys are grumblers. It's a part of your nature. This is who you are. You are complainers. You are doubters. You are grumblers. And because of your grumbling, I'm going to teach you a lesson. Because of your complaining, I'm going to alter your character. Because of this, who you are in your nature, your very being that you're never satisfied I'm going to take 40 years to change that character and to teach you how to truly be satisfied that I'm going to provide for all of your needs. And so this is exactly what happens. For 40 years, they had to learn the lesson of God providing for their daily needs and to trust in God. And what was the symbol of this lesson? What was the symbol of the providing and trusting in God, it was bread. It was bread, this thing they called manna. Now, here again, Jesus say to the disciples, when you pray, say, give us this day our daily bread. See, it's not just about bread, is it? It's more than just bread. It's the symbol of the lesson that the children of Israel learned that God would provide for their needs and that they could trust that God cared for them and that God would give what they needed every day. All right, so let's follow through on this again. I want to just think about the providence of God, the giving nature of God in providing bread. So on the sheet, I did some math. Here's the way it works out in my Dan math brain, right? God provided them with manna. Remember, manna said, what is it? That's what the word manna means, what is it? The thing that God provided they had never seen before. They didn't know what to call it. They said, what is it? And that word for what is it was manna. So they just said, let's call it manna. Let's call it, what is it? There were these flakes of bread that they would collect every morning these flakes of bread, this manna, would be on the ground and they would collect it. Uh, and God really provided. They said in Omer, they were allowed to take each day, it would equal about two quarts. So imagine uh, an Omer is two quarts, so do the math. Two quarts of bread every day per person times 14,600. That's how many 40 years of days would be. So two quarts a day times 14,600 equals 29,200 quarts each person. And then if you multiply that 29,000 quarts times about 2 million people, that's what we think were probably a part of the children uh, of Israel in the wilderness, right? That equals 58.4 billion quarts of manna. 58 billion, not million, billion quarts of manna 
that God provided for his people through the years. See, again, you need to just, you, I hope that you're just awed by the amount, the, the staggering amount of manna that God provided for the children in the wilderness. Because that's the point. God is able to provide a staggering amount for the needs of his people. Nothing is too big for God, right? There's no number that's too big for God to provide for his people. And boy, does he provide 58 billion quarts of manna. That's a lot of manna burgers. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of manna sandwiches. That's a lot of manna splits, right? I mean, that's what do you do with manna every day? They had to be creative, I guess. But that is just a lot of manna, a lot of providing that God did for his people. Now, check out this. It's not just that every day God provided manna in an abundance, all they would ever need, but it's the way they collected it, too, that was uh, important. Remember, they were allowed to take a quart every day. If someone was greedy and didn't trust God and tried to take more than a quart, the whole lot would spoil and rot and get full of, get full of maggots. And so they learned to trust God and obey God, to take only as much as God told them to take, not more, not less. In other words, in God's economy of things, there will always be just the right amount. If you'll trust him, you won't have an abundance. You won't have too little. You'll have just enough. And then just in case you don't understand that God is providing just the right amount in his way, then on the sixth day, remember how this worked? They were to take twice as much. On the sixth day, they could take more than one omer. They could take two omers. And on this day, it wouldn't spoil. All the other days, if they took more than one quart of omer, a omer of, of manna, it would spoil. But on the sixth day, they could take two quarts and it wouldn't spoil. Why? Because God knew on the seventh day, there wouldn't be any manna on the ground. And they would need manna from the day before to carry into the Sabbath. So do you see what a, a beautiful lesson that God is giving them every day that he is providing just the right amount, not too much, not too little, just the right amount for their needs. If they will just trust him and obey him, they will have everything they need. So you see, isn't it beautiful uh, how God works. I wrote on my page, wouldn't it have been easier for the people if God would have just given them like seven days worth on Monday and they could have just collected everything they needed on Monday and it would have lasted through the week and they would then be okay. But that's missing the point. God wasn't just doing this to feed and fill their bellies. God was doing this to feed and fill their minds and their souls and their trust and confidence in him, teaching them the lesson to rely on him for their daily needs. All right. And then what were they to do uh, for the, uh, to, with one special omer? Remember, they were to take that omer of bread and to keep it so that others could see it. And it would be a reminder of generations to come of the providence of God. And you, we know that that uh, Omer was collected and later was put in the Ark of the Covenant. And as the children of Israel moved uh, you know, um, through the Promised Land and finally moved into Jerusalem itself, in that Ark was that Omer of manna. Um, maybe it's still there buried somewhere. We don't know, <laughs> right? Where, the, where is the lost Ark? Uh, don't watch the movie. That's not true. Um, but we know that they did that. They saved that omer so it could always be a reminder of the bread that God used to provide for his people and teach them a lesson of trust uh, and confidence. All right. So why did we spend so much time on this? Because that, that lesson of the manna was drilled into every person's mind uh, since they were little boys and girls by their parents in the, uh, in the synagogue. Uh, they would tell the story over and over again. And every Passover, 
when they would gather on the highest feast for the Jewish folks, they would remember the manna in the desert. They would break and eat the unleavened bread, which would remind them of the manna that God provided. It was so ingrained in them, that lesson of the manna, that Jesus in his Lord's Prayer says, give us this day our daily bread, boom, right smack back to the providence of God in the manna would have been in the forefront of their minds. And that's the way we need to think about the Lord's Prayer in this petition as well. It's not when we say, give us this day our daily bread, that we're asking God for every morning to wake up and find a loaf of Wonder Bread on our front porch, right? That's not what we're asking in this prayer. We're asking, like the disciples did then, that God would provide for our daily needs, that he would give us just what we need, not too much, not too little, exactly what we need to get by from day to day. And we're asking in this prayer that he would help us to trust in him to know what's best, to trust in him to provide for our needs, not our greeds, and to help us be content with what he has given. All of that is in these words, give us this day our daily bread. Make sense? So to conclude this section then, uh, number four on your sheets, the disciples would have heard Jesus say, give us today our daily bread, and their thoughts would have gone to God's abundant and daily provision for his people. Everything they needed to exist, the, all the daily necessities that they would ask for in prayer came through this petition. And so that's the way we need to pray to give us this day, our daily bread. God, would you give me today what I need, what I need for my physical sustenance, what I need for my emotional well-being, what I need for my uh, economic and social well-being. God, give me this day exactly what I need so that I can give you glory, honor and praise and serve my neighbor and be and accomplish the purpose uh, for which you have put me on this planet. That's what we ask in this prayer. All right, so with the last 15 minutes that I have left, I want to just draw some implications then about all of prayer. Like how does give us this daily bread influence how we pray about everything else? Uh, uh, all of our prayers that we utter. And there are four implications to this petition as it sort of filters into our prayers that I'm hoping we can glean. The first implication is this, that prayer should always begin with gratitude, not grumbling. Real genuine prayer always needs to come out of an attitude of gratitude and thankfulness, not out of an attitude of uh, lack or an attitude of complaining. Isn't it astounding, as we said already, how quickly the Israelites forgot the many, many ways that God had provided for them in the past and grumbled about the present. It's a good thing we never fall prey to the sin of ingratitude, right? We do. Um, so here's an easy test, right? How are you doing on this? Praying out of gratitude or praying out of, out of uh, present fears and worries? Here's the test. Ask yourself, do you spend more time thanking God for what you already have, your daily bread? Or do you spend more time in your prayers asking for better health or asking for a better job to earn better money or asking for better friends or for a better spouse or for better kids or asking for more of this or more of that or less of this or less of that? Where do you spend the majority of your time Right? Where are you in this? You know, if I'm going to be completely honest with you, I spend way more time asking for things that I think I need than for what God has really given or what I need. So this is just a great reminder for us to think about, have we fallen prey to coming to prayer out of grumbling, not gratitude? It's easy to do, isn't it? So I think a model for prayer could be this word acts, A-C-T-S. You've heard us talk about this at Faith a lot. I think it's just these four pieces, A-C-T-S, acts, come to us, remind us of these four words, adoration for A, 
Uh, C is confession, T is thanksgiving, and S is supplication. These are just ways to think, to adore God for who he is, to confess our sins to God, to thank him for all that he has given us, the daily bread, and then to ask for things, supplication. And the reason I bring this up is notice in this model prayer, Acts, right? What comes first? Before we ask for anything, before we ask one petition of prayer of asking for things, we have done three other things first. We've adored God for his holiness, his greatness, his wonder. We've confessed that we don't deserve a thing from God. We've confessed our need for forgiveness. And we've come with thanksgiving for all that he has done to love us and grace us and care for us and provide for us. And after that, out of this great gratitude, then comes our supplications and our needs. So... Uh, look at this little thought. The basis of prayer should be gratitude, and it should permeate all our prayers. I agree. I just agree with that statement, that our prayers and our asking flows out of our gratefulness. So that's the first implication that I think we can draw from, from the give us this day our daily bread. Pray out of gratitude, not grumbling. All right. Second implication Pray first for our needs and then for our greeds. Pray first for our needs and then pray for our greeds. So what do you really need to sustain life? What is it you really need? In other words, what exactly are your needs? How much food do you really need? How many rooms in your house do you really need? How many pair of shoes in your closet do you really need? How many cars do you really have to have in your garage? And how many of those cars, do they need to be luxury cars or maybe Yugos, right? What do you really need? How many TVs do you need in your house? And do those TVs need to be a, a big screen or HDTV or sound surround and DVD? Do you need to have a monster subwoofer? Maybe 50 channels, maybe 100 channels, maybe 200 channels. How many channels do you really need? Do you see how easy it is to get our needs mixed up with our greeds? So if you think about life in these terms, anything more than a need is an expression of God's bountiful provision, isn't it? This is the beautiful, amazing, wonderful thing about God. Not only does he provide for our needs, he also provides for our greeds. You know, he gives us more than we need. He gives us in abundance. But the danger with that is that, in, especially in America, we can begin to seriously believe that these over and aboves, these extras, are entitlements. And that if we don't have these things, we cannot be happy. It's easy to do, to begin to mix up needs and greeds for our happiness and our contentment. St. Paul taught something beautiful about where this real happiness and contentment comes. If you want to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, that would be awesome. Philippians chapter 4, I want to look specifically at verses 10 through 13. Paul's talking about where he has learned to find happiness in life. And this is what he says, Philippians 4, beginning with verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord, that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. But I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Do you hear what St. Paul is saying? He has learned the secret of being content. And the secret of being content for Paul was not whether he had a lot of food or little food, 
whether he had a lot of things or little things, few things or many things, the secret was he had learned to rely and trust in God. And once he found that, once he realized that his needs were met and the greeds, the extras were just frosting on the cake, he was content no matter what. Isn't that beautiful? God gives us all that we need to be content. But sometimes he even gives us more. The Bible is clear that God loves us so much that sometimes he gives us even more than we need. And so a question I think is important to ask, is it wrong to ask God to give us for more than we need? Is it wrong to ask God to bless us abundantly uh, for life and for our happiness and contentment? And I say the Bible says no. It is not wrong to ask that as long as we keep our proper perspective. If you don't believe me about that, check out 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 through 15. Here's the word of the the word of God from 2 Corinthians 9, beginning at verse 10. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, there's that bread word again, bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So did you hear here? The promise is that God will not only give you what you need, but he will be generous. He will abundantly bless you, not so that you can keep it all for yourself, but so that you can use it to be a blessing to others. Do you see? So that you can use it to also share and be generous to others around. And everyone is blessed. When you're blessed abundantly, everyone around you is also blessed abundantly. And that's God's plan. All right? So it's not wrong to ask for more than our needs. The, 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 the goal is to keep it in balance. And so there's a verse from Proverbs 30, 8 and 9. I printed it for you on your page if you're following along. That gives us the key between knowing if we're asking for more than we should or less than we should. Here's the key, and in your Bible, underline this verse in yellow or whatever because it is so important for us, right? Here's the, the verse, Proverbs chapter 38 and 9. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Isn't this wise, wise wisdom from Proverbs? Ask not for too much or too little. Don't ask God to make you rich. Don't ask God to make you poor, but ask him to give you, what did it say? Your daily bread. Powerful words, because if we have too much, what did the, uh, the author say? We may forget about God and rely on ourselves. And if we have too little, we might dishonor the name of God. So ask for exactly what you need, your daily bread, and find that balance. All right, so the second implication to the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Pray first for your needs and then for your greeds. Third implication, pray always, not my will, but your will be done. Always we ask in our prayers that God's will would be done, not our will. Because guess what? (laughs) He knows better than you. He sees more than you. God sees the whole picture and knows what you need and and knows what, what to give so much better than we do. It's hard for us to see um, uh, unbiased about what's going on in our lives. It's hard for us to to not let our own need, our own self, our own selfish needs get in the way of what we really need. And so always we ask, God, let your will be done, not mine. Uh, In all of our prayers, 
then we ask that God would help us to accept that will. See, this is something I've learned. I, I, I've often said, Lord, your will be done. But then when it is, sometimes I don't accept it. I'm not happy about it. But when we say your will be done, we're also asking God to help us accept that will. Whatever it is that he gives or doesn't give, we accept it as what is best for us because God knows best. So the third implication is pray always, not my will, but your will be done. Your idea of daily bread be given to me, not mine. And then finally, the fourth implication, give us this day our daily bread in our prayers, is to always pray in an attitude of trust and not worry about the future. That's what God was trying to teach those children in the wilderness for 40 years. And I'm telling you, he's been working it on me for 58 years, trying to get me to learn, to trust him every day for today and not worry about tomorrow. Um, like the Israelites who tried to gather more manna than they needed, we also sometimes worry about the future, thinking, I know God has been there for me in the past, and I'm not so sure that he'll be there in the future. That's what we do worry. We, we forget the blessings of the past and fail to believe that he'll continue to be there in the future. And so we worry. That's what worrying is, you know, doubting God. That's what worry is. Worry is an accusation against God that you don't really care about me, that you won't really provide for me in the days ahead. So now we learn in this prayer, give us this day our daily bread, to let go and let God, to just trust him and not worry that just as he's been there in the past, he will continue to be for us there in the future. So if you're struggling, if you're a worry wart, um, let me uh, say this. Remember, God is giving you your daily bread. Uh, he is there for you to provide. I love the phrase of a great preacher, Dallas Willard, said. He said, today I have God, and he has all the provisions. Tomorrow it will be the same. Isn't that great wisdom? Today I have God, and he has everything I need. Tomorrow it will be the same. Nothing's going to change from today to tomorrow about who God is and what he has at his disposable, disposal to give us what we need. God has all we need today, and God will have all we need tomorrow. He's not going to run out. <laughs> it's not going to run dry. His love for you, his care for you is not going to end. God's love and care for you is, um, it is unconditional, and it was lasts forever into everlasting. So, isn't it cool, then, that this very same chapter that Jesus gives the Lord's Prayer from Matthew chapter 6, right after the giving of the Lord's Prayer, he teaches a lesson about worry. See, in Jesus' mind, these things go together. Give us this daily bread is the antidote to worry. Trusting and believing that God will provide for us in every way is the antidote to worry. And these things are connected in Matthew chapter 6, not an accident. That's part of the amazing, uh, powerful teaching of the Word of God. So he connects the trust in the daily bread with uh, not worrying about the future. All right, my friends, uh, just sort of to sum up where we've been today and what we've learned today, this beautiful petition give us this day our daily bread, is not really about bread. It's about all that we need for life. And it's about trusting God that he will give us today exactly what we need. Not more than we need, not less than we need, but exactly what we need today. And that this trust can, can uh, be with us today and into the future. That we don't have to worry or fret or fear that God will not care for us tomorrow because he has promised to always provide for our daily needs every single day. So I pray that God will just bless you as you pray the Lord's Prayer in this beautiful petition to trust on him to provide for your every need. And in that, as St. Paul said, you will find contentment and peace and great joy. God bless you as that happens today, tomorrow, and always. In Jesus' name, amen.